learn from me. I wasn't the best because I killed quickly. I was the best because the crowd loved me. Win the crowd and you'll win your freedom. I will win the crowd. I will give them something they've never seen before. is Pastor Derek, if you don't know who I am, and I just want to welcome those of you who are listening online and those of you who are here this morning. You can get your worship guides out, and uh, we can get right into the continuation of a series uh, where we've just been talking about crowds, crowd control, the good, the bad, the ugly of crowds, some of the positive influence of crowds, some of the not-so-positive influence of crowds. Last week, though, I did a message and talked about some stuff that, frankly, I've never talked about in church before. Um, some things that I've shared last week, I've shared with people on an individual basis in a kind of private counseling situation, um, kind of in the context and safety of an office versus in front of everybody, and just felt like it was necessary to talk about kind of crazy crowds, the, the cult uh, world that we live in where there's uh, religions that are out there where there's false teaching and false prophets, but then there's also... Uh, cultish behaviors that permeate and infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ. And so we talked about a lot of things related to that last week. Last week precedes this week. And so if you weren't here la la uh, last week, I really, really encourage you to go back. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in review on what happened last week, but I will do a little bit. We talked about things like how to join a church, how to leave a church. These are things that nobody wants to talk about because in many cases, people are coming from unhealthy environments, unhealthy, the climate, the Christian climate of the church, uh, the, the temperature is, is, uh, is unsafe. And so people don't know how to leave. In many cases, people don't know how to come into a church or they come into churches from unhealthy churches and that creates more problems in the church that they're coming into. Can I have an amen or an oh me out there? <laughs> That's how that came out because you wanted to say both at the same time. So the kind of theme text for the last two messages, one was taken from Colossians 2.8, and it basically paraphrases, says, hey, we shouldn't base our beliefs on human traditions or the philosophies of this world, but it needs to have a basis that's a grounding that's on Christ, Jesus Christ. And that is really fundamental to this week's message and last week's message. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 26 tells us to watch our life and doctrine closely, persevere in them because you'll save yourself and also your hearers. So we have to have good doctrine, right? We also have to have a life that represents the doctrine is working in our life, right? And so in order to find that balance and see that kind of plumb line between those two uh, statements, doctrine, life, the embodiment of that, the, per the person who has modeled that, the person who ministered in perfect balance and congruency with that was Jesus. And so when you want to understand how to apply your beliefs, when you really want to understand or see good doctrine, Jesus is good doctrine. Jesus said, I'm the way. We always get that part. Jesus said, you know, I'm the life. But Jesus is also the truth, capital T. And so it's not just a passageway between man and God through Jesus. That is true. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus. But Jesus shows us how to live truth in life and live it in perfect balance. And so to break through the what's right, the what's wrong, and understand the truth, we look at the way he lived. To understand the lesson, I said this last week, in the world, we have to see the, the, how Jesus lived his life uh, in the world. To see the word in action, look at Jesus in the world uh, living that life, faith in action, you can see that with Christ. But in church, 
people for centuries have gotten sidelined and they've gotten sidetracked by deceptive beliefs and deception, forming separations. Those separations or those splinters or fractures in the church actually are known, many, many cases, as denominations. Denomination means divided names. It's a terrible testimony to the work and purpose of Jesus Christ to actually be not just like a monument that we look at, but a movement that impacts the whole world. But the world looks at the church sometimes, unconsciously or consciously, and says, you can't get along with yourselves. Why do I want what you have? And so we have to learn how to unite. And we actually talk about that a lot here at Connect in our spiritual family class the first Sunday of every month. I encourage you, if you don't have a church home or you're kind of in the fringe here, just checking us out, to find out more about what really unites the church of Jesus Christ and what brings us together. And that happens really when we unite on essential beliefs. We have to have unity in essential beliefs. In all our beliefs, we, you know, we, have, to have, we have to have charity. In non-essential beliefs, we show liberty. And those are the things that we'll talk about more as you get closer to a spiritual family like ours. But often, the world accuses Christian groups of, of, of being cults, and sometimes they are cults. Some of these separations and fractures are, in fact, cults. And so we'll talk, I'll give you some contrast between an actual cult and then cultish behaviors that can permeate the church even this morning. But what is a cult? Let's just go over that real quick. You can get your worship guide out. You can follow along on version as well for a more detailed uh, worship guide that's in there. But uh, a cult simply is a small group of people that are gathered together. They're having these religious practices, and what they're doing is regarded as strange or sinister. That's one definition. Another one is a misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person or thing. This is extremely common, and I'll give you a couple of examples and illustrations of that today. Another example of a cult definition is a person or thing that is popular, uh, fashionable, uh, especially among a particular section. This is very common in young people in the next generation of society where they're following uh, you know, uh, nirvana, they're following some band or something like that, and there's cultish behaviors. It could be music, it could be, mu- I don't get upset about, I like certain music, I'm not even knocking, but I'm just saying that people sometimes unintentionally um, idolatrize them and they become unintentionally cult leaders, or sometimes they actually are intentionally trying to be cult leaders in those situations. And you can see this in, 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 uh, in and through media and fashion and whatnot. But a probably more uh, appropriate definition, and I think from an evangelical standpoint, this one fits best, but a cult is a perversion of the gospel. And this is big, and it, it's hard to see it until I unpack it for you, but based on an unholy devotion to a person, principle, or both. And Christian churches, just clearly, let me say, they're not cults, okay? Anything that, any church environment that, that teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, that has their basis on the word of God, that teaches salvation by grace through faith, hey, that's not a cult, but there can still be cultish tendencies, cultish behaviors in the church. And that is unhealthy, and it creates an unhealthy environment. And some people may think, why are you talking about this? Is there a problem? Do you have any issues? No, this is just so that we stay healthy. Because as a church grows, people bring and carry with them the values and the beliefs and the experiences that they've had in previous environments in order to keep a life-giving environment where God can continue to put his favor on an environment. We have to make sure we keep it healthy. We've got to make sure that we see things right. We need to watch our life and doctrine closely. Amen? And so I want to give you some signs of cultish behaviors uh, that we see in the church, and also some cults that are out there as well. Um, and I started with this one last week, and so I'm going to do just a review on the first one, and then I'm going to get into the new material. But the first one we talked about last week at length was personality-driven leadership. Personality-driven leadership. And we talked about this a lot. But I was, I was thinking of a new example, and some of you probably had some exposure to this uh, if you have any... Uh, you know, if you're online at any point in time, but, but uh, have anybody ever heard of kind of the, the, the unification church in South Korea? Anybody ever heard of this? Okay, so this was, this was kind of got a lot of press um, in South Korea where thousands of people, one of the things they're known for was having these mass weddings. 
And um, the former leader, I can't say his, last, his middle name, I don't remember, but his first name is Sun, and his last name is Moon. Sun and the Moon. You know what I mean? That's, hey, parents were, I don't know, they did a lot of smoking pot or something, I don't know. But, <clears throat> but his name was Sun Moon, and, and he formed this, this church in 1954. He died not too long ago, but uh, he, basically thousands of people, one of the things they're most known for is these mass weddings where identically dressed couples would come together. In one case, not too long ago, 20,000 all got married on the same day. Now, that's weird, right? If you don't think that's weird, you're weird, right? Exactly. <laughs> So people, now, what is goal, one of the tenets of this particular church, the Unification Church, was to take people from different backgrounds and different cultures, different belief systems, different languages, bring them together to try to unite the world. And so people from all the world married together, and now they do it under their, their uh, the new, the, the widow of Sun Moon. And by the way, this guy, Sun Moon, was a, he was a business, like, mogul, media mogul. He was very successful. He had a lot of business ventures. They got a lot of uh, attention. He did prison time for some of the things misuse of tax evasions, things like that. He was a self-proclaimed uh, and appointed Messiah. He believes Jesus himself, hello, spoke to him. I don't think any of us, you know, necessarily going to get, not only, some people think, well, Satan himself attacked me. I doubt that. I, I probably sent one of his little minions to attack you, but I doubt you got some time with Satan. And I think we might, we might have the Holy Spirit maybe speaking to you. I don't know that Jesus himself is going to show up and speak to you directly. It's pretty unusual that that would happen. And so, but he believed Jesus himself spoke to him and said, I want you to carry on my work. And, and so he took from that that now he's the Messiah on the earth. So that should, that should be like the old TV show, Warning, Warning, Will Robinson. You know what I'm saying? Like lost in space, dude. Hello. Anyway. So he taught things that were outside Orthodox Christian views, and many deemed him a cult, and they should. And so he'd match these couples and, um, and paired them, and, and it was just some weird, weird behaviors. But this is an extreme example of a personality-driven cult, and sometimes this is, of course, um, outside the Church of Jesus Christ, but we see not the same thing exactly, but we see similarities or or um, maybe it's a little bit less, you know, uh, uh, radical. But I know people that have been in churches. I know pastors who've compromised the scriptures over and over and over again, and 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 have large crowds following them, and yet their leadership is riddled with sin. Uh, there is uh, intra-staff relationships and adulteries. I've heard unbiblical divorces and worldly behaviors and excessive drinking in public settings with nobody worried about that. And, and, and yet, what I marvel at is that the crowds still follow. The crowds still come and knowing about these things. And, and I sometimes would ask myself why. And I believe it's because of the aforementioned that they're following personalities. And I want to remind you what we talked about last week from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, that we don't follow people. We follow Jesus. And we need to follow people who follow Jesus. But we follow Jesus. We don't, Paul said, I don't, I don't, don't follow Paul. Don't follow Apollos. You know what I mean? We just we play a part in the process, but it is God that we build the church on. It's God who makes things grow. Can I have an amen out there? And so we got to be careful about that. And, and these people that are in this, in this position, of whatever of authority or influence, uh, they're sellouts. And they're compromising, cop-outs, and they're compromising the truth. And if it's allowed to continue, what happens is more grievous than, is un than sometimes seen on the surface. Because people that are coming in, these crowds that are coming in, are being inoculated from what the gospel is really all about. It's supposed to transform and change our lives from the inside out. Not make us look like something on the outside, but nothing's changed on the inside. No, it should actually manifest. We should look different than the world. We shouldn't say we're better than them. We should just say we're better off because we know him. Amen? Amen? And so that's really what should be happening, but sometimes it's not. And one of the traits, again, of cultish thinking is we find ourselves being enamored by personalities. And I want to caution you that that is a default. It's a natural tendency for people to, instead of going to God, who is a spirit, and those that worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. We go to man because we can touch and we can talk and we can, we can kind of get up and rub shoulders when we got to be careful uh, in how we relate to leadership. Amen? And I think about that for myself. 
Like, that's the last thing that I want to do. I want to do things that whatever I do, I want it to come through me and get you to connect to him. You know, let, let no man glory in his own power, in his own might, but let him boast, boast in the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 9, I believe, somewhere around there. So here's some new material, okay? So that was a little review of last week. But here's another, here's some cultish tendencies, some cultish warnings for the church. Number two, beware of anything that adds to the word of God. Beware of anything that adds to the word of God. Revelation 22, 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. That's, by the way, speaking clearly of the Bible, the scriptures, the Holy Writ. It says, if anyone adds anything to them. So listen, anytime something is added to the scriptures, that is a cult. That is cultish behavior. And God will add to that person. Look, plagues described in this scroll. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, God. Another scripture, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6 says, Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. It's cultish to add to God's word. There's nothing to add. It is complete. It is full. It is entire. It is inerrant. It is inspired. It is infallible. The Bible is all set. That's what we say up here in New England. All set. Can I get you any more tea? No, I'm all set. Can I get you some more pizza? Well, in Devin's case, yes. But everybody else, we're all set. We're all set. Okay? So, so when, so what is, so to be able to, you don't have to know what everybody else believes about everything else. Listen, listen, those of you who get intimidated by other cults or other belief systems, you have to know what you believe. And when you know what you believe and what the word says, you can easily filter out what the enemy is trying to do to deceive and to distort you. I'm not saying don't study these other religions, but sometimes if you're not equipped and thoroughly furnished and you don't know not only what you believe, but in whom you have believed and am persuaded, the Bible says, then you're, you can fall prey to deception. But it's very clear that anything, adds, that anything that's added to the word of God, so you don't have to know all their other words, know the word of God, and you'll be able to discern the other words that are contrary to his word. Oh, this is so good. I'm feeling, it's early, and I'm already ready to go. Okay? So, for example, and some of you may, may have different exposure and experience, and please don't misinterpret this. I'm not, hear me all the way out, but Mormonism is a cult. And so I know people who are Mormons, and, I, and, I, and they're good people. Don't get me wrong. That's true. You see them maybe as, as you know, having, being moral and, and upright and having good families and things like that. And, and, I, and I can see what you're saying. But the Bible says that even the devil can appear as an angel of light. And, and, and servant of righteousness, it actually uses in one translation. So that means it can look good, it can smell good, you know, but it's not good. And sometimes God, God, sometimes the good keeps us from God. Sometimes good things, God, good ideas keep us from God ideas and God things. Mormonism was started by Brigham Young and Joseph Smith in uh, 1830. Joseph Smith was, at the time, he was known as a persistent liar. He, he, just, he told many mistruths. And not only that, originally, not currently, but they, they, they were known um, and, and it was founded in racism. Now, you may not know this, but you can look it up for yourself, but, but, but they, they changed their views years later. But the big idea about Mormonism is it's known as, listen to this, based on the scripture we just read, it's known as another testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello. That should be like warning, warning, warning. Will Robinson, okay? If you don't know that show, you missed out on a big part of life. <laughs> it was awesome. <clears throat> but the whole book violates these texts that I just read you, Proverbs 36, Revelation chapter 18, okay? But they once believed that people who were black in skin color were actually judged as being Lucifer's friend. They taught that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers, which is blasphemy. Uh, whoever didn't choose to be on one side or the other were punished with the stigma of being black. Well, what happened is later on, black people wanted to come into the Mormon church for the different reasons that were positive about it. And so one of the founding fathers of the faith apparently had another angelic visitation and then came back and said, now black and African-American and can, colored people with this stigma can come into the church. He has spoken. It's changed. So how convenient. But anyway, that's what happened. But they have some crazy beliefs. They baptize the dead. I won't take the time to, to, today, this morning, to talk about that. But that's interesting. Listen to this. They wear holy underwear. Check it out. That's what it is. It's holy underwear. Uh, some of your, some of the wives are like, honey, you could use some, you have some holy underwear. But anyway, uh, 
my husband wears holy underwear. No, I'm not talking about that kind of holy underwear. All right? They are... <laughs> They are, the Mormons are works-based. We don't teach works by works. We are saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of what? Works, not of works. Say the gospel, say it with me. The gospel is not of works, all right? Uh, the the works-based, and if you don't do certain works, you can't even go to temple. You can't even go to church. They, they miss. They uh, mistreat women. It's terrible. Another example of a cult is Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, This is a cult because, again, anything that adds to the scriptures is a cult. And God has strong statements about that. I just gave you two scriptures, but there are many. But the Jehovah Witnesses, they they believe many um, false teachings and profess many false teachings. They, They teach this thing about blood transfusion. Some of you have probably had some exposure to that. They won't do a blood transfusion. It's because of their understanding of salvation that when you become saved in the Jehovah Witness Church, there is a physiological change with your blood where your blood becomes pure and now you are sinless. And therefore, if you needed a blood transfusion and you took somebody else's blood and you put it in your body, now you have sin in your body. Listen, we are not saved by our own blood or, or, or sinful by somebody else's blood. We are made saved and righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. The efficacy and purity of the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Only that is where we find forgiveness and the remission of sins. And any truth that acknowledges uh, Jesus but takes away who Jesus is and what he did in its totality is a cult. It's a cult. Uh, Another example, people who worship Allah Allah, or the Muslims, they teach that Jesus was a legitimate prophet. There's so many things I could say about about cults. Some of them I don't remember them all, but but some I do. But they say he's a legitimate prophet. It sounds good, right? They believe Jesus was a prophet. Listen, he's not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. The Bible, again, says he's the way, the truth, and life. He's he's not. He is God. He's not just a prophet. He is God. God, the Son of God. He's God the Son, and he provided a way for us to be with him forever. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word is God, was God. So it was in the beginning, and he came from heaven to earth. He became, God became flesh and dwelt among men. So he's not a prophet, a teacher, that's blasphemy to say that he's anything other than God. Amen? So there's that point. Next point is, number three, Uh, avoid behavior and teaching that brings people back to the bondage of works. Avoid behavior and teaching that brings people back to the bondage of works. Are you guys enjoying this so far? Turn to your neighbor and say, this is good. Turn to your second choice and say, pay attention. (laughs) Pay attention. Okay. Galatians 3, 1 says, you foolish Galatians. Paul's kind of grieved in his spirit as he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, who has bewitched you? Strong words. He's basically, how has Satan got his hold on you? What kind of a a cultish, you know, uh, deceptions have gotten around you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? In other words, were you saved by works? Or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? This is how we come to Christ. Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Are you trying to prove something by what you do? Are you trusting in what's been done? Are you leaning on the Spirit of God? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask you, does God give you His Spirit, work miracles among you by the works of the law? No. Or by believing what you've heard? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so Paul is challenging the Galatians and saying, hey guys, you started in faith, you realized how it was done through faith and not by works, but who's tricked you? Who's spoofed you? Who got in the middle of of your belief system and sidelined you and sidetracked you? And I've seen this come into uh, Christian environments, a a more 
uh, subtle uh, example of this, I was uh, principal of our Christian school for 14 years, Metro West Christian Academy, which I'm very proud of our school. It's over two decades old. There are not many Christian schools that can say they've been around that long, and uh, we've seen a lot of people's lives changed. But I can remember in the early years, because we would hire people from different backgrounds and different church environments, similar to what I'm trying to do with the church and make sure that we grow and we stay healthy, there were different times where, as the principal, I would have to pastor people. But I can remember this particular family that called a concerned parent. And anywho, this, this particular child in the, in the classroom kept asking his dad every single night, Dad, Dad, am I going to go to heaven? Dad, am I a Christian? Dad, am I going to go to heaven? Am I a Christian? This dad really was like, yeah, of course you are. Let's just say the boy's name is Johnny. Of course you are, Johnny. Jesus loves you. You've kept Jesus in your heart. You're saved. You stop talking like that. Why do you keep asking those questions? Why do you say that? Well, my teacher keeps asking me, Johnny, are you a Christian? Because if you were a Christian, you wouldn't behave like that. Okay, so, so I heard about this, and I'm like, thank you. And I'm trained to kind of back up my teachers and, you know, that sort of thing. And I hear this. And so I hang up the phone, and I, I beep, I need to see so-and-so in my office, you know. And, uh, and so I have this appointment with one of, my, one of my teachers. She was a wonderful teacher, and she, she loved God and all that sort of thing. So I started asking questions, and I basically going through kind of what had happened in the phone call that I had and, and uh, saying that this particular parent was convinced, that her, the son was convinced that he wasn't saved. And I said, you know, you know what, what's the problem? You know, was this true? And, this is what, and the teacher told me basically this. She said, you know what? Uh, it's because he doesn't tuck his shirt in, and he runs in the hallway that I keep saying that. And I wanted to say, well, you know, why didn't you shoot him while he was there? I mean, that's awful. You should have just taken him out. Now, I, I love Christian schools and I love churches, but we can allow subtly these cultish behaviors to come into our church where suddenly we go back to that which we are called to leave. Are you guys tracking with me? And this surfaces in many ways. This, just this last week, a few days ago, an appointment was made with me. I don't know how it happened exactly, but, you know, we're just an open and friendly church. And so this couple uh, scheduled an appointment through Gretchen, and, and uh, they sounded like they were looking for Christian fellowship, and they were looking for community, and they just wanted to kind of find out more about the church. And she steered them to the normal avenues, like come to a service and go to C101 and all these different things. But, no, they wanted to talk to me. And so I just, okay, okay. And so that happened. And anyway, long story short, uh, these people were crazy. I mean, loco, okay? And I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it. I thought, I love these kind of appointments. I'll be honest with you, I had two really tough appointments in the morning. I remember leaving my last quote-unquote tough appointment. I thought, oh, it's just gonna be, the rest of the day is just going to be great, and I can't wait for that last appointment that I'm going to have with these new people because I love meeting new people and talking about God and the church and just kind of unpacking myths. and but I just love all that stuff. Woo! I was not ready for this particular appointment <laughs> at all. They were basically self-appointed wardens of the church, and they just go around from one church to another trying to prove people as false teachers and false prophets and getting into all kinds of debates and arguments about the scriptures, and they taught distortion. They taught uh, things that were not true, and I tried to stay calm, and it took me a little while to figure out what was going on, and they believed, they actually believed they were sinless, that once you got saved, you never sinned again, and I thought, oh, we're having some, you know, that's weird. And if you don't, eh, anyway, I wanted to say that, but I didn't say it, but I was thinking it in my head, and, and uh, they, were, they were eisegesis of scriptures, you know, where they were just interpreting, basically eisegesis is interpreting uh, uh, interpretation that's done by notions and ideas that are born outside of the scriptures. And then they use the scriptures to support those notions or those ideas as opposed to exegeting the scriptures, which, you know, is what is God saying through the author to the original audience using other uh, uh, analysis, you know, canonical, can canonical analysis, history, logic, rational, you know, and just the spirit of God overseeing all of that. People, these people just pulling scripture and just making it say, and as soon as I zero in on that to try to correct that, they'd bounce to something else. And, oh, my gosh, when they left, they basically would not shake my hand and called me an apostate. <laughs> That's how that meeting went. So needless to say, I didn't win friends and influence people that day, but they twisted, I, I had to let them go, but they twisted and manipulated the scriptures. But listen, here's, here's, the, here's the reason I share this with you. 
I actually didn't do what I was supposed to do in some respects. I, I got baited. They, I believe they came like in sheep's clothing and they were wolves. So there's some understandability to this. But the Bible warns us in 2 Timothy 2.23, it says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Titus 3.9 says, Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies. That's like fine print and my position in the food chain and all these things. And arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and use, useless and mad. Matthew, it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. They said they were sinless. Interesting. That should have told me right out, right out of the gate. So we have to be careful. And I eventually caught and I realized what was going on and, and of course, showed them the door. So there's some people that we have to just be careful to, to, to protect our heart. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. Some, pe some people we don't get into these debates with. How do we know if they're wrong and we're right? Because does it violate what God's word says? Is it bringing us back to works theology? Those are the kind of examples that God will reveal to us. Amen? Number four, beware of people who pick on. This is cultish behaviors coming into the church. This is a specific one. Beware of people who pick on the successes of others and attempt to discredit them in order to exalt themselves. This is a cultish behavior that is prevalent in the church. Look at this scripture that the Lord showed me. This is awesome. Psalm 101 verse 5, it says, If anyone, this is where it usually happens, secretly says things about his neighbor, I will stop him. I will not allow people to be proud and look down on others. A lot of times people are talking behind the back of other churches and other church leaders. That is not good. It's quiet in here. It's quiet in here. Just <laughs> may the court note that it is quiet in here. But basically what happens is sometimes we have to exalt ourselves to knock somebody else down. We don't need to do that. We don't need to be paying it. We don't need to be worried. We, we don't need to spend all our time policing other people's behaviors. We don't need to be spending all our time seeing what everybody else is doing. We need to spend time changing our own behaviors, working, working and growing in our own relationship with Christ. And I think we lose if we get caught up in this kind of behavior. You know, the Bible says pride cometh before a fall. So we think we're all that. We ought to not think of ourselves at all. You know, we need to have a humility about ourselves. And let's not be associated with critics and self-appointed wardens of the church. Maybe it was, we're not as extreme as these people that came into my office that want to prove me wrong and tell how I'm a false prophet and a false teacher. You know, they said to me, you know the scriptures, but you do not have understanding. <laughs> that's, that's how that went. So I need to make sure, and you need to make sure, we don't do that in a more subtle sense with other churches. Listen, if they profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and people find salvation through him, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to see the Holy Spirit, level of the Holy Spirit, uh, the water level of the Holy Spirit raised in a region, not just in our local church, inside the four walls of this church. We need to pray for other churches that they're successful, that they get healthy. And we need to do whatever we can to help people get healthy in Christ. Amen? And so we get caught up in all these minor doctrines instead of major doctrines. And we, we're always, churches a lot of times are more into what they're against than what they're for. We're not about trying to just make a point. We're about trying to make a difference. And when I, when I said that to these cult leaders, they were basically just saying, you know, you know, we need to make a point. We believe our calling is to bring truth to the church and make sure that, make sure that they see where they're wrong. I'm like, well, I, I think we need to make sure that people who don't go to church need to see the error of their ways and pull them into the church through love and through truth and grace, all basked and bathed in love. And it's a big difference. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible says knowledge puffeth up, but love what? Buildeth up. It edifies. Oh, it's so good. Oswald Chambers, a pretty, pretty important dude, if you don't know who he is, but he said, when God reveals faults and flaws in others, it's not for criticism, but for intercession. Ooh, and I don't mean we're praying for you. Oh, we're praying. Did you hear about so-and-so? Yeah, we need to pray for him. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> not that kind of prayer. So we need some humility. And so anyway, um, just a sidebar. I want to say this for our church. We have this phrase, and I want it to be more known, but we don't steal sheep. We don't steal sheep. Our focus is not to grow our church by and through other churches' failures, mistakes, shortcomings, bumps and bruises, okay? So, so we're not, we, we should not cultivate. We should not um, do everything. We, we should not steal 
sheep from other people. We should not go in and try to recruit people from other places to fill slots and lanes and get things for our preferences. You know, Luke chapter 16, I, I, I just call it the Luke 16 principle, but the Bible says, be faithful in that which is another man's and God will give you your own. It's speaking of a vineyard that you are and have influence over. So this vineyard that God's given us influence over is what we're supposed to take care of and do a good job with that. But we're not supposed to be going into other people's vineyards and pulling things out of their vineyard. They're responsible for that before God, okay? So let me contrast that with, with but sometimes sheep have no shepherd. Sometimes sheep are wandering, and, 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 and they don't have a fold or a family to belong to. Sometimes they're, they're broken. Sometimes they're black sheep. And so we have to handle those situations responsibly. And we encourage people to stay in their churches if they are healthy churches. And by the way, healthy doesn't mean perfect and it has a program for your kids that's perfect and all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying a healthy church is not always a perfect church, amen, because we're not, that's for sure. But are the people growing? Is it a place where you can grow? If it's not, that's a different story. And you need to have some, and we've given guidance on how to leave well last week, and there's, but you got to make sure that you leave well so that you come in well. To a new church. So I would encourage you to, to seek God and seek counsel and consider maybe sometimes if you're being affected by a cultish environment. But if you're not, stay plugged in where you are. Go and grow. Amen? Often that's not the case, though. So sometimes we need to leave. But we shouldn't do it out of preference. We shouldn't do it over differences that could be resolved. We should do it over the things that simply uh, are irreconcilable. And I'm not talking about the world's definition of ir irreconcilable. I'm talking about God's. Amen? Amen. Can you handle that? Yeah. So we got to be careful not to steal sheep. If you know people are plugged in another church, do not recruit them to this church. That's wrong. That's just wrong. Next point, number five. <laughs> <clears throat> Some biblical advice about cultish behavior, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe you come from somewhere else. I'll just say this. Sometimes we don't, um, we don't, we got here through a different set of circumstances. I don't know. It wasn't the perfect set of circumstances. I believe God can redeem that and he can work that out. But, but, but it's important that you don't bring cultish habits in. And maybe you need to ask the Holy Spirit to check you and show you. But bottom line, and we talked about this last week, come to help, not to hinder now, some people don't intentionally come to hinder, but that's why you might need to be, you got, you got help, hinder, but in order to make sure that doesn't happen where you hinder, you got to get healed. And I would just say to people that have been hurt, you can't get healed by yourself. Let me just put a tough question out there. How's it working? How's it going? See, here's, the interesting thing is that, that Satan uses people to hurt people, but the same thing that Satan uses is the same thing that God originally used to heal people. People. God uses people to heal people. And there's nothing that will heal you faster than doing life with people. And I would say there's a risk, and I recognize that, but there is no return without risk. God uses the devil sometimes, excuse me, the devil uses people sometimes to hurt people, but God uses people to heal people. And so if you come in and there's hurt, don't just bury it because it'll bleed out. Get healed, get help. We want to help you. We want, to help, we want to help you get healed. This is a good, this isn't a perfect place. This is the perfect place, what? For imperfect people. But this is a place where you can get healthy and you can get healed. Amen? 2 Timothy 2.16 says that we need to avoid godless chatter. Paul's talking here and he says those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. And then he calls out these different people, Herminius and Philetus. I mean, he literally, Paul's just like not holding back. He's like, yep, and that guy and that guy. And they've strayed from the truth, and they're saying things that just are contrary to what God says about the resurrection, and they're trying to overthrow the faith of some and distort reality. And just the Bible's saying, don't hang around with these people, with their em these empty chatterers, this godless kind of chatter. You shouldn't be spending, you know what, if people spend their time doing the majors, what God wants us to be focused on and functioning in, you won't have time for all these things. Get about what God's business, and you won't get caught up in all this godless chatter and ungodly behavior. And by the way, all that stuff, when you get into that, it's, it's incestuous. We're just picking, you know, my lint picker example. You know, oh, my gosh, they got this problem, this problem. I'll spend the rest of my life just picking lint. We, we got to stop looking inside. 
and stop and start looking outside the four walls of our own life and our own church walls. Amen? Titus 1.10 says, For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those, and he's talking, this is stuff that relates back to then, but this works-based circumcision group. They must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households. So basically what Paul's saying here is, run them out. Get them out. If those people are doing that kind of stuff where they're taking people back to that law, taking people back to that works, taking people into these special topics that we need to major in and make whole belief systems out of, get them out of here. Run them out. They're, they're dangerous. He's telling us to silence those voices and stay in the, in the new covenant, a new covenant of grace and of love. And the Bible is warning us cautioning us. Sometimes this happens in the church, and what happens is it gets so internalized and introspective, it starts pursuing a purity. We came out of this. I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, a pure word. And we start saying, oh, those people aren't really saved. The really saved people live like me and like this. Listen, that's not healthy. That's not good. Those people, you know, and I get the motivation. It's just wrong. Just because the motive might have been good in the beginning, it's still wrong. And ministries are doing this, and they're going to these higher levels and these deeper waters. And you know what's deep is doing what God says and loving God and making disciples. That's deep. You want to grow? Keep reaching out to people. Nothing grows you faster than taking care of someone else. Look at your family if you're a father or your mother. What caused you to grow? It was when you had to take care of someone else. And that's what God's trying to teach us, and that's how we grow, amen? It's not us four, no more, we're right, we're right, praying in the corner, just this elect group of people, and only us. No, that's not what God, he wants many, many to come to salvation. Woo, we got a better covenant, we got better promises, we got a better deal. And so, I, I'm, anyway, I'm getting excited. So, <laughs> all right, so don't get messed up in all that kind of stuff, you know? I, there was this, this particular member of our church years ago, and and I, I certainly won't say this, these people's name, and, and I knew and I loved his family, and, 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 and the husband, he got deceived, and he, he got very isolated and insulated, and he started going to the Google over the Bible. Uh, he didn't have this relationship side down, so he didn't have the, the, the revelational knowledge. I'll come back to that in a second. He had the head knowledge, and the head knowledge began to uh, override and, and be superimposed on his relationship with God. The relationship started going away. He got taken by fear and by deception, and he got really, really weird. In fact, he started basically telling me there's going to be a food shortage, and when the economy fall, you know, crashes, which is going to be really, really soon, he started selling all his assets and buying silver and gold, and he, and he started collecting it and hiding it and storing it, and then he started putting food away, and then he decided, and he started getting guns so that if anybody, when, when this whole thing crashed and everybody's looking for help, he was going to fend them off instead of live by faith. Is everybody tracking with me? And so he, he was stirring everybody up, and he wanted me to tell all of you what we need to do. I said, dude, you got weird. If you don't think that's weird, you're weird. I love you, man, but you're getting really weird. You're scaring me. He wasn't showering, wasn't shaving, just living in the basement. Eventually packed up his family, drove out to Oklahoma, where he's going to live in Oklahoma in a, real, a more safe and conservative area where it would be less likely for there to be mayhem and, and anarchy. And, 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 you know, uh, there's a word where, where the military comes in and, and you know, takes over, and, and he thought it would be less likely to hit there. And so on the way out, gets in a big fight with his wife. They split. Their marriage split. She goes south to live with her family. They split up all all their silver and gold on the road. That would have been an interesting sight. Hey, did you see that, honey? You know what I'm saying? And, and they go their separate ways. Now, I believe they're back together again. I think he's coming out of the fog. But how many know that's weird? That's cultish behavior. And the signs of that, that behavior is splits and divisions and discord and quarreling. And, and so we got to watch out for that. 2 Peter 3 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfast. 
steadfastness. He's warning us to not be compromised in your faith, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We got to avoid these things. First Timothy tells us the same thing in chapter three, you know, to certain men to watch out for strange teachings and doctrines and don't pay attention to these myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to speculations rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Second Peter one says false prophets arose among the people then, and it can happen now. Now, just as there will also be false prophets among you, he's saying in the future, who will secretly, look at this, secretly introduce destructive heresies. I want you to notice that word secret. That's a big problem in our culture today. Another example of a cult, and this will rub some feathers, is the Masons. So just listen. Please don't get offended. Uh, I know that they do some good things. I I understand that. I'm not arguing that. Um, They stick together. That is for sure. My grandfather was a Mason. But they, but they, I'm familiar with some of their documents. I'm familiar with the levels that they have in their, in their organization, their handshake, things like that. But it's not scriptural. The Masons do a lot of good, but, what they, but they teach these layers of secrets. And at each layer, you get more illumination by these secrets. When in actuality, it's brainwashing. It's brainwashing. And so Jesus said this, you know, and how do you, how do you discern some of this stuff? And I'm just going to wind up with some of this contrast to just not just knowing the Bible and knowing the word, but having revelation knowledge about the word through Jesus, okay? Matthew 16, it basically, Jesus, you know this story, but he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then they replied, well, some say he's John the Baptist, and some say he's Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And Jesus said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And then Peter spoke up and said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, bravo. Heaven, you know, it wasn't through knowledge that you got that. It was through revelation that you got that. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And now I'm going to build my church on this revelation, by the way, not on Peter, which is the Catholic position, is that we're going to base and build the church on Peter. No, he's saying, I'm basing it on what you just discovered, that through revelation of who Jesus is, confession and revelation of who Jesus is, I'm going to build my church. Good job, Peter. Way to go. And so it's through, it's the relation, Jesus is good doctrine, relationship, revelation with God and who he is in relationship with him will keep us free from deception and keep us free from error. So we need to study, but we need to know the original. Now, I was thinking about this, you know, some of you, uh, anybody have a bank account? Raise your hand if you have a bank account. So I have 10 $1 bills in here, and I'm not giving them away, so don't even think it. <clears throat> I'm a giver, but, you know, I already did it this week. Uh, but uh, one of the best ways to, to train a bank teller at one time, I'm not saying necessarily now, wasn't it to introduce a bank teller to all the counterfeit monies that are out there. The best way to train a bank teller was to be overly familiar with actual money, with, with original currency. And so when somebody is counting, you know how they go, you know, they're going like super, super, super fast. They could immediately detect or pick out a counterfeit by feel. So I'm saying this because sometimes when people start talking, I, I know this to be true even in my own family. You know, Dad, I don't know about that stuff like you do. And tell me about this. Tell me about that. And then every now and then my kids will say, oh, it freaks me out because I don't know that. I don't know that. Uh, you know, and they're basically saying, like, if you weren't here, we'd be like, woo, who knows? Somebody could come in and we wouldn't know this and we couldn't know that. Listen, I'm trying to eliminate that because it's through rela- knowing the original. You'll, my wife's a perfect example of this. She may not know chapter and verse like me, but we'll sometimes be going through things. She's like, wait a second. What was that? That didn't feel right. Something wrong with what so-and-so just said. Something wrong with that. That doesn't, that doesn't connect with my spirit. It doesn't connect with my Jesus. It doesn't connect with my relationship with God. The best way to never be deceived and come into deception by all the many currencies that are out there being purported to try to keep you away from Jesus Christ is to be familiar with Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Amen. Does everybody get what I'm saying? This is critical that you know Jesus and that you know him well. I know what I believe, but I know in whom I have believed. Amen? So I, want to, I just want to pray for you. We got to stand to your feet. Just with uh, every eye open and no heads bowed for a second. 
if you don't have to, you don't have to uh, raise your hand to this, but that's what I want you to think about for a second. If you've ever experienced or been exposed or to some kind of deception or distortion of truth or anything like that, I just, I just I want to pray for you. If you've been exposed to a cult, you've been exposed to cultish behaviors, I want to take a moment and I want to pray for you, okay? So now you can close your eyes. If you know that's you, everybody though, please just close your eyes. I venture to say many, maybe hundreds, have been exposed to that through our church. And I just, right now, as, as the under-shepherd, Jesus, you're the shepherd of our souls. Jesus, you're the head of this church. But as the under-shepherd of this church, I just pray a, just healing to people who've been exposed and experienced cults and cultish behaviors. And if you know that God is speaking to you, you might need to come down after the service today and receive more prayer in this particular area. I don't want you to leave with any ill effects from that exposure. You, you've heard the truth, and the Bible says that the truth that you know will set you free. But you got to know it. And you don't know it just in your head. You know it in your heart. You know that you know that you know. Like a woman knows she's pregnant, you know it. God wants you to know the truth. And he wants to be that truth to you at a deeper level. Jesus wants to move from your head to your heart. And so any person that has been ill, has been affected in some negative way by cults or cultish behavior, I pronounce healing on you in Jesus' name and your minds. I pray that you give each one and every person, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman, the mind of Christ in Jesus' name, the helmet of salvation be upon their head in the name of Jesus, that they know truth, they be able to discern wrong from right, deception and distortion, so they know, they know that this doesn't feel right, and they're able to run from it and remove themselves from it in Jesus' name. Now, for every person that's here today, Every head bowed, every eye closed at this point. And you've never, when I gave that analogy of that money, knowing the original, you don't have that confidence that you can detect the original. Maybe it's because you've never met the one. Maybe you've never met Jesus Christ and him crucified. Maybe you don't have that relationship with him. Jesus is madly in love with you, and he wants you to fall in love with him. And he is waiting to come into a relationship with you. And if you've never come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation for you. It's not done by works. It's a gift. And every gift has no value if it's not opened. It's a priceless gift, but it has no value if it remains unopened. To open that gift and receive Jesus, you have to open your heart and say, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life today. And I want to pray for you right where you are. This prayer is a decision that starts a journey that will change you from the inside out. And it changes not only your eternal destination, but it changes your relationship now and forever as you go forward. If that's you and you know you know, the Holy Spirit's kind of knocking on your heart, would you just raise your hand and say, pray for me right where I am? I want to make sure today that I've met Jesus and I know him personally. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you pray this with me? And those of you that are listening online, would you pray this with me? Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You are God the Son. And you came into the world to have relationship with me. And I pray that that relationship would move from my head to my heart. Save me from the inside out. Change me. Make me a new creation in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap all over the place.